My name is Giles Dooley, and I have two great passions. One is photography, the other is food. Fuck. <laughs> I document the impact of conflict around the world, meaning I'm often in new cities and unfamiliar countries. When I'm not taking photographs, I am on the lookout for new and exciting places to eat. Meals cooked from the soul with love and passion. But food means more to me than that. I believe I take a better photograph if I've eaten with the person first. Food is a remedy. It's how friendships are made. I would say when I'm cooking, I can hear my ancestors whispering behind me. <laughs> food is how the world connects and how I connect to the stories I tell. Much of Beirut is shattered this morning by one of the most powerful peacetime explosions ever. Prime Minister is pointing to a warehouse full of ammonium nitrate. Suggesting an act of negligence, not terrorism or malice. Like everyone, I was shocked to see the explosion that devastated Beirut on the 4th of August, 2020. Beirut is like a second home to me. I spent a lot of time here over the past few years and many of my friends were impacted. The huge blast devastated the city, killing at least 200 people, injuring over 6,000 and sparking violent protests. Driving through Beirut, I'm shocked by the scale of destruction. I've come here to see what's happened to my friends and how I might be able to support them. The first place I want to visit is the Armenian restaurant Mairig. It is less than half a mile away from the port where the explosion happened. I had seen footage taken the restaurant in the aftermath. It had been destroyed and many staff injured. I wasn't sure if they'd even be open. Eileen Kamikan is one of the world's leading Armenian chefs and the person that introduced me to this amazing cuisine. Oh. Hello. Hi, hi. <laughs> How are you? Oh, wait, the fist pump. <laughs> it's a new hug. I know. Welcome to Lebanon. Thank you. Thank you. And it's nice to come back back here, even though I know it's been... Uh, we managed uh, to do whatever we can. I'm yeah. like, it's been, a, it's been a month and a week now. It's still a little bit upside down, but slowly, slowly, we have to do it. I saw, yeah, your posts about what happened, seeing the damage in the building. And I mean, you were really, you were really hit hard, huh? There's nothing, it's three seconds away, you know, like bird flight. There is the, the office, the highway, the explosion. Mm. I was on the terrace filming. My team, we, we were having a management meeting. They were inside the office and they were shouting on me, come in, come in, don't stay out. Unfortunately, they were very badly hit. Yeah. It was all yellow dust. You can't see anything. So I didn't see what's going on outside. And I started to remove them one by one, my financial controller was very badly hit. Uh, his uh, left side was all gone. His eyes was outside, so I had to put his eyes back. He has a very bad bleeding on his right hand, so I stopped his bleeding. I removed his shirts. I did the first aid. I did the PCR. I wake him up. My accountant was bleeding all over. But he stand up to help me to bring down my financial controller, bringing down three floors. The worst was when I came down and I saw here, it was like, if I knew up, I m would have maybe gave up. Yeah. When I came down and I saw everything, like the cars were upside down, the building were down, people running with old blood, everybody's holding the wounded people. Everything was still blurry, blood, very bad smell and shouting. I mean, I know for me personally, I was injured by a, a bomb blast. And when I saw the video, it brings back for me all the trauma. As soon as I, I see this, you know, I, I know I know this feeling, the, the shock, the confusion, the, the chaos. Um, and yeah, you know, Beirut is a city that's close to my heart. I have many friends here and, and I can feel that the, the the trauma came back for me and I, I, because I know what people are feeling at that moment. And it's, 
It's something you never get over. No. Unfortunately, you become inhumane. You become, you take decisions. This one I can help. This one I cannot help. I had to disregard an old woman to save the young guy. I'm like, sometimes I say, how did I do that? But I cannot. Yeah. I cannot do anything else. Me, I don't know how I'm alive. I was the closest of everyone. For me, there was one thing. If I'm still alive, that means I have a mission. Yeah. That means I have to kind of give back. This is where I started to feed people, to make sure my people are okay. And I'm doing whatever I can with the little mean. I mean, like, it's very difficult. I was, I, I'm cooking 2,500 meal per day and I'm still receiving a lot of phone calls need more. I, I can't anymore. I'm like, financially, I'm ruined. My office, my restaurant, my cars, my home. In 30 seconds, in three seconds, everything is gone. Mm. I lost everything physical, but I have this urge to give, urge to tell, urge to be there for people. And it's interesting, food at a time of crisis like that, you know, maybe to some people food seems trivial, or, but for me, food is life. I mean, it's, it's, food it's, is not just, it's not just about sustaining life. It is about community, it's about rebuilding, it's about hope, as you say. And, you know, food, food is a symbol for people. The whole team at Myrig are working day and night to make sure the restaurant can reopen. Eileen wants to make sure her staff have job security during the current crisis. He is my assistant. Mm. He was with me. This was all broken. I redid it. Here is, we used it as depot, and down the entrance where we were, the bar, it's also gone. The last time I was here, I was actually sat just here. It's my friend's birthday, um, which was, I guess, why, why it's so shocking when I saw the blast happened and I saw all the damage here. You just realize how close to home it is. I lost my home, so uh, all I have right now is whatever I have in the mountain. Mm. So we're gonna do the mountain. Ah, okay. Okay. My favorite. For me, it's the most important. When I was a kid, when I wanted to help my mom, mm -hmm. my deal was she cook first, so I eat to do. <laughs> Otherwise, I won't do. It takes a lot of time, but it's so yummy. So here we have the meat. Mm -hmm. This is around four big onions. We have the seven spices, the black pepper, the white pepper, the Armenian mm -hmm. Aleppo, pepper. Aleppo pepper. Okay, Which it's I not. Love. It's not spicy. No. It's, uh, I don't like the spicy, and of course salt. Food for me is, is showing love. I learned this from my family. I cannot cook for someone I don't love. Mm -hmm. I cannot. I don't know. I mean, like the basic things will not work with me. And especially that I'm Ar Armenian, we had a heavy baggage of the genocide. So food for us was the belonging. Mm -hmm. Remembering my grandma, every time she used to cook some special dishes, she used to cry because this is how she remembers her mom, because she was very young when the genocide arrived. In front of her, all her family was massacred. And for her, this is a way of tribute. This is a way of being with them. That's what I say, is when I'm, when I'm cooking, I hear my mother whispering in my ear, and I hear her mother and the mother before. They, they whisper to me as I cook. And you know, for me, I'm lucky. I, I travel the world. There are maybe a dozen places in the world that I always go back to. And Meirig is one of those. So every time I come to Beirut, I always come here to eat. And why? Because when I eat in a place like this, the food, of course, is amazing. But I feel it's more than the food. I feel the love. I feel it's like a family place. And those are the places that connect all the ones that I go to regularly are because I experience something more. I feel like I'm home when I go into those places. I feel like I'm touching history, touching people's past, their ancestors. So that's why this place for me is, is you know, my number one when I come to Beirut always. What you're saying gives me hope to continue what I'm doing because it's exactly that. For me, my league is, I say, if you want to eat, you can eat many places. 
But for me, my rig is a place where I have to tell the Armenian story through food. Thank you. Small salad selection. Nice. Amazing. Here you have eggplants filled with rice and uh, chickpeas. The red pepper powder and the yogurt is a must. And here you have the Swiss chard with nuts, rice, and also a red pepper paste and a lot of lemon inside. You know, I almost feel like crying. This is the first time I've eaten that I haven't been eating cooking myself for six months. I'm almost too excited to start. I'm like, eh. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Crispy and creamy, yeah. uh, hot and cold, you know? We do a lot of contradictory uh, taste. Yeah, amazing. So, bon appetit. Thank you. <laughs> this is the cherry. Yeah. With the kebab and the yogurt. Okay, I try it all in one. Yeah. The bursting. Mm. I'm actually struggling to speak. I'm just so happy. Food is just... Mm. Food is everything. Warm, cold, yeah. the sweet, the sour, everything. I have tears in my eyes. Whatever I'm down, I'm really depressed. This is, this makes me, life is good. And also again, the crispy, the creamy, the hot, yeah. the cold, the yogurt is room temperature, okay? The sauce is sizzling and the manta is just out of the oven. And on top of it, the sumac. Again, yeah. we use a lot of sumac. Amazing. Mm. If you haven't tried Armenian food, find a restaurant near you and go. It's complex, challenging, and deeply comforting. Every day of my life, I get a lot of pain. I get pain in my legs, I get pain in my arm. There's only two times when I don't feel pain. When I'm taking a photograph, for some reason I don't think it, and when I'm eating something like this, I forget that. Only time. I would love you to cook with me on Wednesday if you want. We're cooking 500 meals. Wow. And distributing. Amazing. I would love you to be with me. I would, because I would, it will yeah, be really to. give another measure, especially for mm. the people. Yeah. If the, if you don't want. No, I would be honest. And one day, I'd if you have time, I'd love to take you to my mom, the real Mayrik. Mm. And she will make you something. <laughs> but that's, that's the thing, isn't it? It's like food is, it's like this history. Whatever I cook, she cooks better. Yeah. <laughs> I learn from her, but no matter what I do. I'm, I'm half better. Italian. So it's okay. the same, like, Lama, like the authentic. Lama, it's always like yeah. that. Thank you very much. No, thank you. I'm like in heaven. We say goodbye the way we do now. Yeah. <laughs> Hope to see but you I'll see you soon. soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Eileen's Armenian food connects to years of struggle and resilience. My rig was at the center of Beirut's destruction, but it's now at the heart of its recovery. It's true that good food heals, makes us whole. Even before the explosion, this was a country in crisis. Since October 2019, there have been widespread anti-government protests triggered by the economy's collapse and corruption. My friend, Saman Kawam, has been at the forefront of these protests. I wanted to get his opinion on what was happening. We don't always agree, we sometimes fight, and we often drink too much, but I treasure my conversations with Saman. Over the years, he has reminded me of what it is to be an artist. He's a revolutionary, forced into exile from his home in Syria, and he has never held back from fighting for what he believes in. Saman lives and collaborates with another artist, Fadi El Shama. Together, they are working on a large installation inspired by Lebanon's recent events. See, that's really hard to look at. I can't even look at it. But it's, it's here in my face every day.
It's a good breakfast, I reckon. Yeah, Always. Cheers, man. Cheers. Cheers. That's really good. It's good? Really good. Is Iraq the drink of the Middle East? Or of no, Lebanon? Of, or of, uh, of Lebanon? Syria. And Syria. Syria. And so you, you, drink this back, you drink this back in Syria? Yeah, sure. Mm. So uh, it's an honor to cook for the chef, <laughs> for the friend and the chef drives. Because cooking is, a, is an act of love. That's what my grandma taught me. So this is mm. served cold, like uh, revenge. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to experiment with the, with the cheapest ingredients, mm -hmm. with the situation right now in, in Beirut. The supermarket, yeah. they have no, no steaks, mushrooms instead. Cheers. Cheers to your health. Cheers. Cheers. And this is where you were when the blast happened? And how far away are we? Five minutes away from the, from the blast. Like, one of the things that always amazed me when I go to a city that's been in a war is, it's very, so random. One street is perfectly normal. You turn around the corner, the next street's been demolished. What's shocking here is just the scale of it, because it's every street, it's every street. Yeah, exactly. It's like, there's no escape from it. Mm. Yeah. The only thing I've seen comparative is Mosul. And Mosul, after a year of bombing, it was just yeah, yeah. destroyed. But you know, I remember again, Burn land. a really amazing moment. In the middle of the worst part of downtown, somebody had what used to be a really nice municipal area with gardens, somebody had planted a few flowers. And now anybody who's never been to war would say, this is crazy, why are they not doing this? There's so much work to do, why would they do that? But I would watch, every time I passed that, I would see a child walking by and watching them. I saw a soldier once watching them as he walked by. Everybody would go by and they would say something to them. And only when you've seen that level of destruction, you understand why those flowers meant so much. But walking in, in, in where is right now downtown, the old, the old markets, where vegetation take over everything. Yeah. When, where there's no more people, and nature take, take over. It was beautiful, that, that beautiful dis destruction. Mm -hmm. yeah, it turned into this wild garden, except there, there's a lot of mines and a lot of bombs and smell of death. death and... So planting, yeah, planting mm -hmm. flowers is, is... That was delicious. We're not finished yet. Sweet potatoes. Mm. I was taught cooking by, by my two grandmothers, a Syriac and an Armenian. So, I always try to fuse these two together. And food is something, you know, that remains for people that have been forced from home or chosen to leave. It's like you go to New York. If you go to New York, you go to the Italian court, the Chinese court, uh, most, nobody in the Italian court has ever been to Italy. They don't speak Italian. But the food, they'll only eat Italian food and they'll still talk to you for hours about the best mozzarella, the best tomatoes. And it's almost like for, for people that have become migrants, people that have become refugees, food is like the last thing that you hold on to. Because there's memory. It's, it's you like can have an empty bag without any, either, but you take with you your food. Yeah. And, and I think that's the, the core of, of what a human is. <laughs> when I was in hospital, I was there like a year, so it was a long stay, it got very boring. And, because uh, I was in pain, but because it was so often, the, I had like a bottle of morphine. And my friends would sneak in red wine, because every evening I would get the red wine, pour my morphine in it and stir it. How, how long did you stay in, in the hospital? One year, yeah. one year. Full year? Mm. 37 operations. And until you started to be able to walk? Or then to walk again. To... Yeah. I was in coma. Yeah, 46 days. 46 days. Because my, my lungs stopped working, kidneys stopped working, heart stopped working. They basically almost declared me dead at one point. And they, the doctor said to my family, they said, I think we better you turn everything off. Because they said, you'll need dialysis, they'll need this. And my brother said, well, he's fighting, we still fight. And what is this? Halal to jiban. So it's, uh, it's a cheese. Cheesecake. Mmm. Uh... <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> and have an extra. And say the name again. Halal to jiban. Sweet, uh, sweet, sweet, sweet cheese. cheese. Thank you. Saman has had many dark times in his life. He's been arrested, 
his family members tortured. He lost a leg to a landmine, but he's continued to fight for change. This time though, things seem different, as if he has lost hope. That evening at my hotel, over a bottle of whiskey, we continued our conversation. For me, I don't care if Beirut is being rebuilt or not. I want someone to be held accountable for what just happened or it's gonna happen again. No one is held accountable. The people should know the story about the corruption here. Because this is the, this destruction is not, we're not in a war. It's not an industrial accident. Everybody I know is sedated. If there is a fine on you, like on, on your house or your factory or whatever, they don't let you pay it. You have to go back the, the back channels. <laughs> <laughs> they make you go back. Yeah, to, they make you become the, complicit in the yeah, whole. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But the people, everybody, everybody was a complice in, in this. I am, I am myself, I'm today. I want for, for the world not to forget about those 200 people who died. And I mean, you've seen it all before in Syria. I mean, you've seen a country destroy itself. And... It's a war. Mm. Everything is ex expected and, and accepted yeah. in a war. We're not in a war. What would make people rise up if this doesn't? After this, nothing. Mm. Nothing. What else? Yeah. Seriously. Beirut is always this place of hope and strength and people always like overcome and mm. find joy and, and Man, this time it's, it's... Fuck hope. Mm. You need to work. Keep on hoping and nothing is happening. Something is wrong. <laughs> Keep on hoping. <laughs> For what? I don't want to do hope. I, I never did hope. Anyway. <laughs> I always worked. Just for no hope. <laughs> <laughs> I've always loved Beirut's energy. It's a city full of young and creative people, and I've always felt inspired being here. I find it more exciting and vibrant than New York or London. But I know a lot of these young people are thinking of leaving now, and I worry about the city's future. My friend, Stephanie Atala, is a Lebanese actress, and I wanted to see how the situation was affecting her. Cocktails. Yeah. Espresso martini. I think I need yes. an espresso martini. Yes. Okay. Okay. So two espresso, two espresso, espresso martini. martini. Okay. Let's see. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Enjoy. Cheers. It looks good. Yeah. Cheers. Mm, that's a good one. It's a strong one. It's <laughs> I've shot many short films in the streets of Beirut. And it's, uh, it's very sad and yet very weird that now the films are gonna... Be a memory. Yeah, just be a memory. Some of the shops that we shot in do not exist anymore because some people, they don't have the money to go back into business. They mm. lost everything. Because it's three things. You have the financial crisis, yes. so everyone lost their money. Then you have COVID, so everyone's losing business, and then they get the, the business gets destroyed. Yeah, so, so how initially do you... they, don't, they didn't have enough money to sustain their businesses, their fresh businesses. And now with the blast, they lost everything they were building step by step, and now it's all gone again. So uh, there's no hope for some people. Everyone is leaving. My, my best friend just got married and just left for Canada. She was like, yeah, you know what? Fuck this, I'm leaving. Um, most of my school friends, they're not here anymore. Yeah. They're everywhere, like in the US, UK, Europe, everywhere. And that's hard. Yeah. We were ready to fight, really. Uh, there's, um, there's still like some people um, fighting a lot for the country. But most of us just gave up. Mm. I just want to live somewhere. I just want to have a drink with you here without dying any second. Mm. And, and yeah, nobody feels any security, any like safety nobody. in your home and nowhere. Yeah and we cannot travel because of the COVID now. And everything is just suffocating mm. us. Like, yeah, 2020, cheers to that. <laughs> it's the 2020, <laughs> surviving 2020. But the world, I feel like when they hear something like that that happened to a third world country, they're like, ah, for like two hours. And they share the news and they speak about it. And then they move on because 
this is what happens to third world countries. Or, or like countries in the Middle East, they're always war, it's always destruction, like, they're used to this. Yes, and they're it's not used the to us suffering. That's the idea. And they forget easily, and they stop helping, and they stop... You know, one of the things that was really interesting, because obviously we were planning to come here for this, and it happened. Yeah. And like even like my hairdresser, people were going like, oh, I was watching on TV, but the, the people being interviewed seemed like cool and hip and like us. They were like really surprised. Yeah. Everywhere I go, everywhere I travel, they think I'm Spanish, Italian, and then I go like Lebanese. They're like, in the US? I'm like, no, no, not Lebanon in the US, Lebanon in the Middle East. And everyone is surprised because we speak many languages, mm. we know things, we live, we have a, a beautiful country, beautiful food. Yeah. They don't know that, no. beautiful music. To have a future. Yeah. I think, again, that's what I've spoken to a lot of people. They're like, I just want, to have a little bit of security. Like, I just want Ability. to know that I can build something and it won't be destroyed. Yeah. And build your career, build your home, build your family, and for it not to be knocked down again the next week. Yeah. Yeah, there's one thing we say in Arabic, Ijrhun, Ijrhunik. So one foot here, one foot there. This yeah. is what I can't do. Is doing I can't do that. <laughs> That's why I'm fucked. <laughs> Yo, Allah, I'm at this point in my life where. I laugh so hard and I want to end up crying after the laughter. Mm. I feel so bad for laughing. Most of the survivors from the blast, we have this guilt feeling that's roaming mm. for like a month and a half now. It's horrible. You feel like you, you missed something that day. Yeah. Like you should have been there with everyone else yeah. in the blast. And that's horrible to say, right? No, it's the same. It's like I, I get survived with guilt. I've had people whose, whose sons died in Afghanistan and they write to me going, thank you for living your life. It reminds me of my son. And I just go, but also people say to me, oh, you must have been incredibly strong that day. And I'm like, no, the people that died were just as strong. It was just they weren't as lucky as me. Yeah, it's luck. A lot of times it's made me like, why, why me? And then some other kid who was younger than me, had more to live for, dies. And yeah, there's times when that, you know, again, again, almost like you're out having fun and then you're like, this person who was next to me the same day is, is not able to. But you can't live like that. You have to live. Life is random. Absolutely. And the trouble is after a really traumatic event, we, we kind of go into a mode of just not wanting to risk emotion. We become, I just want to, and then we stop living. You're playing Tetris. Yeah. That's life. Mm. I feel like it's a, it's some sort of a test or a, I don't know. It's but it's very scary when you realize that actually everything can just disappear overnight. You know, you can't go to the bank. You can't, like in, in the UK, suddenly we're locked down. You can't go to a restaurant. You can't, the kids can't go to school. You can't do your job. People have never experienced this in, in my country, in, in living memory. Yeah. And. For a lot of people, a lot of my friends are really struggling with it. And, and for Lebanon, it's worse. You know, you suffer extra traumas with that. But it makes everybody feel unsure. Let's just live on unimportant things. Yes. We could live happier. Mm -hmm. I want to stop worrying about work. And then I'm, I'm like, you're stupid. Just call us, live your life with the small details. Just enjoy this drink. Enjoy meeting a friend, enjoy the small things, because tomorrow there might not be a tomorrow. Yeah. Just live every second. So this is what I want to achieve, really. This is the core of living. Mm. This moment. One of the things I love about my job is that I'm often alone in foreign cities with time to kill, meaning I can find new places to eat or shop for local ingredients. And there is nothing better than stumbling into a real gem, like this one, Chez Jean-Claude. You have a good uh, wine for the morning? A red wine? Perfect, breakfast wine. You know, it's okay, I, whatever the chef says is good, I will have. Thank you. Wherever you eat, it's about instinct. You just know when you walk in a place, you're gonna get a good meal. I don't care about reviews, I don't care about Instagram. You walk in a place, Within 30 seconds, you know that's going to be the place to eat. And this one's got me excited.
When a chef cooks in a silk shirt and cravat, you know you're somewhere special. More incredibly, Chef Jean-Claude didn't open his first restaurant until he was in his 70s. He's 82 now and still in the kitchen every day. Kevin, thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Nothing beats the steak. And that's gotta be my top five all time. Just the caramelized outside, as soft as you could be inside, great meat, great texture, everything. Thank you for bringing a big smile to my face. <laughs> How long have you had the place here? 10 years. 10 years. And you trained as a chef in Lebanon? No. Autodidact. Mm -hmm. The best. I was a home cook for a okay. long time. Yeah. Because my wife uh, did care much for it. I was in the clothing business all my life. I had a shop in New York. And I had a shop in Paris at the Zorch site. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, I came back. And uh, I opened a clothing store right next door. Mm -hmm. And this was a flower shop. Here. Okay. One day they, this, they, they had a falling with the owner of the building. They slashed the place and left. I was scared that he would rent it to somebody I didn't like. Mm -hmm. A bad neighbor, you know. So I decided to rent it to make a restaurant. My wife was in Paris on vacation. During the month of You're in trouble when you go back. Huh? I decorated the place, finished it, <laughs> and she came back like 40 days later, the place was ready. I told her we're opening a restaurant in five days. <laughs> you know, it's like you walk into some restaurants and I know the food's going to be good just because it feels right. Everything feels right in this place. It's, it's really a wonderful. It was for a, for a long while, but mm. now with Corona, everything is my stuff. It's a challenge, huh? I hope I can keep it. Mm. But it doesn't look that way. Because now, you know, distancing yeah. and all that. So small spaces don't work together. That's the sad thing. A lot of the restaurants with the real character are the ones that will suffer the most. Huh? I love this painting as well. This, yeah. this, that's uh, great. I bought this at the flea market in Paris. Beautiful. Well, thank you. I'm going to enjoy the rest of this. But it's absolute heaven. Go ahead. Absolute heaven. Cheers again. The food was impeccable. Classic French cuisine in the heart of Beirut. But there was a deep sadness to Jean-Claude. He'd already been struggling due to COVID restrictions and damage from the explosion meant most of his restaurant had to remain closed. And just last year, he'd lost his wife. I've seen people bounce back from devastating blows, but sometimes a person is just too tired or too old or they just had to rebuild too many times before. I left Jean Claude's a little heartbroken, but I vowed to return and make sure others knew about this special place. That afternoon, as promised, I went back to meet Eileen to help her prepare food for those left homeless or unable to cook after the explosion. Restaurants were amongst the worst hit by Lebanon's many crises, but they were the first to rally together to provide food for their community. How are you? Great, great, and you? <laughs> good, good. So this is the other place? Yeah, this is the Bachik. Oh, good, thank brother. you. We've turned it to a community kitchen. Now upstairs is the part where we serve the community kitchen, uh -huh. and inside we increased the kitchen, and we've done a cooking line. Hello, up. <laughs> I tasted rose syrup for rose the first syrup. time. This is the rose syrup. Because ah, I was going to try this with vodka. We do the jalib with vodka, it's very nice. Did you try the jalib? No, no, no. The jujuba. Okay. I, we will try we'll now. We'll try one. some, yeah. <laughs> this is one part, yeah. now it's going. And uh, I still have the pasta to cook. It's 
so we're doing a pasta with vegetables and tomato sauce. Nice. And for the parents, we've done the beans with uh, rice. Mm. Actually, at least help with the stirring. Yeah. Bit of rosemary. Mm -hmm. This is the with the pepper paste and everything, so oh, I mix wow. it. Oopah! Ooh la la! <laughs> With all the love, Italian and Armenian exactly. together. Ooh la 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 la! La nonna, la mamma, everybody's here. So this is going to people that were made homeless or yes. unable to work? This is the homeless because of the explosion. Mm -hmm. They don't have any houses. They cannot cook anymore. Yep. So we're cooking 2,500 meals per day and distributing through NGOs. Thank you, Chef, for your assistance. You want to sign a, a, a hard a message of love? Yes. Who wants to taste? There were an estimated 300,000 people left homeless by the blast. They would have gone hungry if it were not for a network of grassroots organizations like Eileen's that came together to fill the void left by the government. Later that day, Eileen took me to meet her beloved mother, Batui, so I could learn more about their Armenian heritage. Armenians play an important part in Lebanon's multi-ethnic makeup as they have since 1915, when a huge wave of refugees fled here to escape the Armenian genocide. For Armenians, it's important to preserve their cultural identity, to keep that connection to their homeland. And food is at the heart of that. A gift passed down through generations that connects them to their history. Okay, ice water. Mm -hmm. My mom will love me for this now, because it's really cold. She will have her hands. I think it's ready. Huh? Love it, love it. It doesn't like anything. <laughs> You'll get it right one day. You want some wine? No, no. Janet, sir. What have you done wrong this time? I know. Jam ne couscous. Sorry. Put your glasses on. I get very excited about food. I get very. <laughs> Everything I've done in my rig is basically whatever I learned. Do you approve when you go and eat at the restaurant? Does she approve then? She likes it. But There's always like you could have done. What, what did you do here? <laughs> it's nice, but. You didn't wait enough, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay? Okay. So this is what's in here? The yeah. cracked wheat? Yeah, like bulgur wheat. Yeah, but the but bulgur wheat, yes, exactly. What she does right now, she gives the water. Yeah. So the wheat is a little bit... Expands a little bit. Expands a little bit, takes the water. You want to eat this one cold. Okay. Okay, I leave him five minutes like okay. that. After, I put the chili and... Huh, no, okay. Like that. I, okay. It's okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. And what meat is this? Lamb, uh, what we take is uh, the entrecote mm -hmm. and we beat it. Okay. And this was taught to you by your mother? Yeah. Has passed down generation to generation. generation yes, mm. And there's something I think it, certainly in, in in my country we've lost so much of this things that are passed down from yeah. you know mother to son, mother to daughter, with these traditions of, of doing things the way they've always been done. It's the most important part. Mm. Yeah, la mom, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it, mom. Yeah, 
Look one to try. Mm. Good. Very good. This to me is the best food. Being around mothers and nonnas. No. Just preparing traditional food in the sun. There is cold the meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you messed up with the meat. It's definitely too cold. Yeah, I know. You're in trouble. I told, I told you. I told <laughs> you that she would <laughs> the meat also. Yes. Uh, yeah, really. Mm. There is we five minutes I want yes. to say. Sure. Hey, you're fired. Uh. <laughs> Watching Eileen's mother shape the Shea Kufta with such precision, each identical in size, was hypnotic. It seems so simple, yet takes a lifetime to master. I could have watched her for days. So how long can I stay? Where? Here. <laughs> I'm not leaving. It's up to you. <laughs> I don't think you can stand me for more than one hour. <laughs> oh, Laura. Cheers. Cheers. Here you have the Armenian basil. Mm. And everything you see inside is from the garden. OK. May I serve you a bit? Please, thank you so much. <sighs> the colors are so vibrant. <laughs> Enjoy. Mmm. <laughs> it's so nice, the spring onion just brings that little... So you used to cook with your mother when you were young? I started to cook very young with her. The main reason, every time I wanted something from my father, it was food. I always wanted a motorcycle, but it was you know, <laughs> Lebanese, Armenian with this community, a mm -hmm. woman on a motorcycle. So I started to learn food. I started to cook. <laughs> now, there's nothing for me better in life than food like this, sitting in a garden, things that you know have come from the area. It's just, yeah, heaven. Yeah, I, I like to eat the season. Mm. I like to enjoy the season. Are you preparing them for me? Let me, let me explain something from my mother. Okay. Uh -huh. So now she's giving you pistachio. I feel so that means like you're adopted. Yeah, no, I was about to say, I feel I very have, special that she's making my, the pistachio. I have pistachio to take care of my place now. <laughs> <laughs> Everything, <laughs> especially in Armenian family, it's like Italians, mm. it's like la mama and the food. Yes. You know, it's absolutely. like if the food doesn't pass, no, nothing passes. Mm -hmm. In my years of travel, where languages failed me, I built friendships while sharing amazing food and wine. Luckily for me, Lebanon produces some of my favorite wines. The Sept Winery has an almost mythical story. Meher Harb, the founder, left the country after his father was killed in the Civil War. So many here have similar stories, but Meher had a deep urge to return home, to grow grapes on his father's land and reconnect to his heritage. You're welcome to Sept. Is that a white tomato? It's like... Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, the mountain yeah, tomato, yeah. so no, I, uh, I, I choose them green. They're beautiful. Right? It's gonna be like this today. <laughs> You're like me when I'm in the kitchen, it's like, <laughs> just feel what right that Yeah, day. What, what feels all right, huh? it's never the same. I, I used to live in France, I okay. lived there for 12 years, mm -hmm. and I studied math and finance and computer science, and I worked for seven years as a consultant in finance. And uh, I had something deep, deep in, in my heart, very important, was to come back to my uh, dad's land. This is my father's land here. Okay. I lost my father during the Civil War. I was seven years old and he was 33. So all my life I was trying to find a way to give him back a kind of uh, homage, you know? Mm. The wine always came to my mind, you know? A memory with my father, harvesting grapes. We, we were never in the wine business, but we, we used to have grapes. Yeah, you grow. Yeah. Exactly, do some Iraq and stuff. And directly when I thought about winemaking, I felt really, this is the calling. Yeah. So basically I'm a self-taught winemaker. I came back in 2010 and transformed this land, transformed it into a vineyard, planted, I planted 5,000 vines alone. Okay. People s started thinking <laughs> the guy is going crazy. <laughs> And uh, I started making natural wines. So spontaneous fermentation, no yeah. added yeast. All my wine comes 
Every bottle comes from one single vineyard. No additives, no filtration. Very, very yeah. authentic, honest, uh, and I hope you'll you'll see when the, when yeah. you taste the wine. And now, cooking is becoming uh, something. A, a good passion also, yeah. like the wine. So I made this table, this kitchen, where I can cook and look at my wine, so i always in uh, synergy yeah. and harmony. And that's it. Lovely. No, I, I understand. I, mean, it's like I used to be a fashion photographer, but I, I couldn't well, I find... I just wasn't happy. But you can't quite work out what it is, because, because you know, I'm sure you're earning pretty good money, and you've got a career and these things, and, but nothing, something is not, nothing. Uh, it's not real about it. No, exactly. Something is missing. Yeah. Something profound here. Yeah. It makes you cry. Exactly. Yeah. So it was the same for me when I started then using photography to tell stories to, you know, I cover, I don't cover war, but the effect of war. Okay. But it's funny how food then also came into my life. Mm. You know, my mum used to be a, a servant. So I grew up around food. And then a few years ago, I started cooking again. And I realized that food is the antidote to war. War takes away humanity. Food is about sharing. It's and a peace pact. No, exactly. When you to, sit on a table, yeah, and it's it's you're opening up for uh, new people, new culture, exactly. And you're putting all your judgments, yeah, behind you. And it's about giving. It's about sharing. About it's sharing. about sitting, talking, communication, Agreed. all the things that war is not. Yeah. It's a healing process. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. Food. Food is my healing process from war. Yeah. Are you, how's, are you hungry? Always. Yeah? Yeah. Jais, we're <laughs> gonna drink some wine. <laughs> we have to, right? Cheers. Cheers. And what grape is this? This is Albaidi. So Albaidi is uh, our indigenous grape. This is a grape that is, that grows only in Lebanon. It's beautiful, it's so full of like life and pear and yeah, citrusy a mm. little bit. Well, cheers and... Uh, it's so delicious. Happy to have you here, man. Oh, it's, it's heaven. <laughs> as I say, as soon as I saw you cooking, I was just looking at the food and it's funny how you can just, you know you're going to get on with someone because you look at what, what they're plating up. And you, you understand the character. Right? Exactly, exactly, <laughs> straight away. More? Yeah, it's, it's delicious. As a winemaker, modern winemaker, in school, they teach him how to create balance in wine. I realized from observing nature that a human being cannot create balance. Mm. The best balance is what nature will give me. So from the grapes until the bottle, I accompany the wine, I don't intervene. Mm. I understand how, how it works, and I'm here to make sure everything goes as nature wants to make good wine. And for me, this creates a natural balance in an imperfect way yeah. that gives it so much uniqueness and a big difference. I totally understand. If you give people the wine that they think, they, they said, no, I always like this, I always like this, they'll be like, it's fine. When you give them wine, they go, I don't know. Hmm. Provokes you, makes yeah, you think. Exactly, and then you go you away and maybe you don't like it, but it's made, exactly. you, it's made you think, and that's the secret, so yeah, wow. cheers to that. Cheers. You, you, you understood it well here, what's happening. And thank you, <laughs> well, thank you for that. Cheers to that, cheers, cheers to life. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Happy, happy to have you. Voila. Wow. Like his wine, Mehe's food connects with the land, the seasons. It reflects the nature around him. Here you go. Amazing. It is simple and honest. I'm gonna go bring another one. So if, if we must. You must. Okay. <laughs> For me, what you're supposed to smell before drinking is my land here, this land where we sit on. For me, this is what it says. You know, it expresses 100% the soil, the land, the weather. Not only that, all the energy of our ancestors and the energy of the future. And I'm honored to, to drink it in, in this place. <laughs> I'm honored to share it with you, my friend. Thank you. Cheers. This is the strangest comparison that's probably ever been done to wine. Okay, stick, stick with me. This is like the master of a martial art. Uh -huh. Like Bruce Lee. Oof. He would do this punch where he could stand that way, inches from somebody, 
and knocked him over by that because his energy was so subtle, but it's also so graceful. That's a beautiful comparison. Man. Because I just thought it was so subtle, but it absolutely hits <laughs> you. But it's so gentle and, and delicate and yet f full of power. Mm. Just a little. Just a little. Don't worry, there's, <laughs> there's a lot where, from where it comes. And here it is, first strain of the season. We're a lot alike, yep. but you've been hurt. You've been hurt mm -hmm. yourself. I've been hurt yeah. because someone yeah, no, got I mean, hurt. Yeah. And I was gonna be hurt, but someone yeah. for me still protected yeah, yeah. me not to be hurt. And this is very uh, intense for me. Mm. And I really am really grateful to meet you and honored. But you know, when, when, when I got injured, somebody said, how did you cope so well with getting injured? I said, it was the 40 years leading up to it mm. that gave me the strength of, mm. that actually this was like, you know, it sounds funny, but superficial. So you, you lost your two legs? Both legs and my arm. And yeah. you were on, uh, what do you call that? Yeah, the prosthetic leg. And you, and you walk normally? Yeah. I mean, I, I the, more, the more wine I, I drink, the better I walk. <laughs> <laughs> Let's drink some more so, wine. Man. Sometimes I get home, like I have a night out, and I'm like, how the fuck did I get home? Because it's like, you know, stilts? It's impressive, man. I really, uh -huh. I, I have to say it. It's impressive. I think now we can start smelling yeah, yeah. petrichor. Yeah. Petrichor, that incredible smell when rain hits dry soil. But I wanted you to come oh. here to really have the feeling. People enjoy this wine around the world. But I know I'm one of the few people that would enjoy it in the rain with the petrichor. Very few people. What's left from my Syrah? So you're drinking the wine mm -hmm. and the grapes. That's the grapes. That made this wine. Beautiful. Take the rest. Cheers. Cheers, man. Happy to have you here. It would come as no surprise that the next day I woke up feeding a little worse for wear. But a breakfast of champions, coffee and eggs, and the beautiful country hotel, Bituma, sorted me out. On the drive back to Beirut, I had time to reflect on what I'd seen and heard over the last few days. I don't believe we can make ourselves more resilient. Rather, resilience is life's gift in return for suffering and difficult times. And for a city or country, it is the same. Years of turmoil and pain have made Beirut one of the most resilient cities in the world. And despite the unimaginable challenges the city is facing, I know it will bounce back. But it shouldn't be like that. I see my friends. They are tired and exhausted. The people of Beirut deserve better. The next day, I met Stephanie for a photo shoot. Whilst my work is documenting conflicts, my first love will always be portraits. Photography has always been my way of meeting people and communicating with the world. This is about the sea, it's just you're in the way of it. Yeah. It's like a beautiful picture. It's like a beautiful picture of the sea and, and somebody in the front. <laughs> you're photobombing the sea. Nice. Actually, can you be a bit more dramatic? No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm at the limits, I'm at the limits. <laughs> Great. That's so gorgeous. Before I left Lebanon, I wanted to take Stephanie for dinner at Chez Jean-Claude. Normally they are shut on a Sunday, but Chef Jean-Claude kindly agreed to open just for us. Along with a bottle of set wine, there couldn't have been a more perfect way to end my trip. Shall I give you your birthday gift? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> okay. The first time I met him, I was like, we were talking about how I'm acting and oh, how so acting funny. is in the region. And I was like, yes, I have big googly eyes. And he was like, yes. I was like, and ever since? You were like, I'm quite insecure about my googly eyes. And you like, and you're like no, they're really big. They're, really, they're probably bigger than you think they are. You could have been nicer, Giles. I don't know how come we're still friends. And yeah, and today for the makeup, he was like, yeah, 
We both know you do not have to put a lot on the eyes. It's like, you don't need to exaggerate so mean. the eyes. I don't know why I'm seeing you today, but I still got you a birthday gift. Cheers. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> It's both of us with googly <laughs> eyes. And this is an apron that says, the chef is always right. <laughs> Which is true. Should I put this on too? Yeah, it's oh, one God, this is so funny, it. yes. Chef <laughs> 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 uh, Jean-Claude is gonna turn up. <laughs> like, doing that sophisticated meal. <laughs> Chef Gilles. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> I haven't laughed that hard in 2020. This is from the is guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so we can try it. Tonight? Yeah. You think we can? Yeah. Okay. I'm sure it'll be fine. Bonjour. 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 How are you, sir? Good to see you. How are you? Happy. I, I went to see uh, my friend who does sept wine. And I brought a bottle that I thought we might like to try with me. So. Okay. We... Sounds awesome. Cheers. Cheers. Smells good. Mm hmm. Uh, there we go. Cheers. 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 Mm. Oh, that's good, huh? Yeah. It's really good. So. It's Lebanese. Yeah, it's Lebanese. Lebanese. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had to order one of Chef Jean Claude's signature steaks, the perfect accompaniment to Mayor Hare's wine. Merci. Shall we? Bon appétit. Bon appétit. It's good meat. <laughs> it's really good, no? It's really good meat. Were you nervous the first time you actually, like, cooked for the public? Because it's one thing to cook at home, it's another thing actually to cook for, for customers and... No, I was always cooking for somebody mm -hmm. at one time or another. I used to take my pots and pans and go to my friend's house and cook there for 10 people, 15 people. So, do you mind me asking, but these photographs that are around here? They were in Saint-Tropez. Okay. Is, is, are you in the top one? In the, yes. With the dark top on? It's a lovely. My wife and daughter. Oh. Beautiful. Your wife was very beautiful. She was, uh, Thank you. What was her name? Her name was uh, Sophie. Wow. Beautiful name. Do you mind if we go check the other part of the restaurant? The one no, that... not at all. Yes, sure, sure. Tu veux de... Si jamais elle marche sur les... Euh... Il marche sur les... Attention, bébé. Attention. Ouf. Tu veux m'attacher la halak? Non, ça va. C'est terrible. Mm. There's glass on the floor like two months after the blast. No, it's really dangerous, là. Vraiment, là. Le plafond, il, il tombe. C'est triste. Inshallah, you're going to open it up. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to say. Smells amazing. When I was in hospital, and I was going through all that pain, all those difficult times, and you sometimes feel like giving up, I always said there'd be days like this. 
And that's what keeps you going through the worst times, is you remember there'll always be days like this. And so I, I appreciate them when I have them. For me, this is the perfect night. One of my best friends, one of the best steaks I've ever had, and one of the best wines I've ever had. So the three together, I'm very grateful. So thank you. Thank you both of you for making this evening so special. Thank you for having us. And thank you for having us. Yeah. Santé.